I think a distinctive voice means a North Dublin voice. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be asked here today uh, for a couple of reasons. I suppose firstly because um, this is a very important organisation. Um, the National Parents Council play a key role in Irish society now. They didn't always, but now they do. And that's, it's great for somebody like me to have an opportunity to talk to people who are working within communities, promoting parenting, promoting the importance of parenting, and of course promoting children's welfare. Um, I suppose the second reason I'm delighted is I understand I'm probably one of the only male speakers today. Um, and thirdly, I'm delighted because I have a wife and two daughters, so I rarely get to talk for 40 minutes without being interrupted. <laughs> So, so don't dare try and interrupt me, okay? Um, can I just start by asking you uh, to turn to the person beside you. If you don't already know them, introduce yourself and just say to them, well done for being so committed to, to parenting. Because to come in here on a sunny day and you can <laughs> sure that uh, I hold your attention because this is the graveyard slot. It's the two o'clock slot and any, work, you know, any, any day is always the graveyard slot. So just like any good teacher, okay, I might just pick on anybody uh, in the audience at any stage and say, do you agree with that? <laughs> All right? The second piece is that um, I'm going to present some stuff today and I really want people, if they think it's rubbish, to say it's rubbish. All right? So if we could rehearse that a little bit, and I'll give you a tester. So this morning, for example, I went swimming in Port, on Port Marnock Beach before I came in here. No, that's actually true. Okay, that's true. When, when people meet me, they, they say I remind them of Nicolas Cage. <laughs> that's rubbish. Okay, okay, we, we've, got, we've, got, we've got the drift. Um, I have one simple idea to present today, okay? Nothing fancy, um, a very simple idea, and that is the idea that if we focus on raising emotionally healthy children, then we will get the balance right in terms of their academic achievement, their ability to uh, thrive in an educational environment, and probably as important as that, we will, as parents, keep ourselves uh, healthy and keep the balance right for ourselves in terms of the education system. Um, one of the most important things that enables us to do that is looking at our own education. And I'm not going to spend too much time on this today, but I do want people to reflect on it. So as you walked in the door, I think you were handed um, sheets of paper. So what I want you to do is I want you to write on, write on two pieces of paper, two positive memories you have of your time in school. Okay? Very quickly now, we haven't got all day. Yeah. And write on two pieces of paper, two negative memories you have of your time in school. So you should have four pieces of paper just off the top of your head, all right? Okay, so two, two positive memories, two negative memories, and hang on to them in your hands. All right? Have we done that? On four separate pieces of paper, yeah. Okay, while you're doing that, I'm going to just keep moving on. I was just asked to remind you that everyone will get a copy of the presentation, so you don't need to take any notes. So if you just write your stuff, and then we'll move on from there. So who are the key players in education? In my view, uh, there's four key players. I know there's lots more, but the four key players in education are teachers, uh, siblings, friends, and of course parents. All right? And our child's ability to thrive, our child's ability to do well in education is influenced by those four, people, four, uh, four groups of people. Of course, I think it's useful to say that the education system in Ireland now is very well developed. We have a really good education system. Compared to my day in school, compared even to uh, everybody in this room's day in school, we have made such advancements. We have, yes, we have the department who've always done their job as they have, but that department has developed and advanced. We have the Education Research Centre that produces 
incredible research into education, is looking at curriculum development, etc. We have a whole load of players involved in the education system, but the key players on a day-to-day -day basis are the, are the people on this slide. So, what's a parent's role? And this, I think, is probably um, the most important message of today. In my view, um, the, the most important thing for parents to do is to focus on developing their child's emotional health. And that involves, in my view, five key things. The, those five things probably are the essence of parenting. And those five things are what enable us to engage with all of the various different environments that our child uh, interacts with. Social, sports, uh, education, etc., etc. Let's deal with the first one. The first one is the concept of love. Now, very few people when they're talking about education talk about love. But essential to raising emotionally healthy children and essential to ensuring that our child thrives is this concept of connecting with our inner love for our child. And that involves a number of processes. Sometimes we do it automatically and sometimes it takes a bit more work depending on the type of person we are or the type of circumstances in which we're parenting. So what am I talking about? Well, that concept of loving our child unconditionally, valuing the uniqueness of our child and believing in our own natural parenting ability. In other words, that concept that we are best placed to parent our child. And that when, when push comes to shove, no matter what's happening, they're failing at maths, they're not settling, you feel they've no friends, that we go back to that first core thing, which is, I love my child more than anything. I love my child, and that's going to influence what decisions I might make and what I'm going to do in this particular situation. The other things that that involves is exploring and resolving our own belief systems about our child and about childhood. Okay? So, th and that involves the impact of our own childhood and our own parenting experience. And what do I mean by that? Well, it'd be grand if we were parenting our kids on our own with nothing. Well, we've neighbours, we've other parents, we've their friends' parents, we've got teachers, we've got all these communities interacting with us on a daily basis. And they impact on how we might see our child on any given day. So even though we might connect with that love, we also listen to all these other things. If they don't do well in maths, they don't do well in English, if they haven't got friends in the first week, they're in trouble. And all these things are floating around. You also have those belief systems about children that are out there pervading all the time. So if you let kids free to do what they want, they become bold, they become disruptive, they become out of control, etc., etc. Knowing and understanding ourselves as parents, why we became parents, and how we see ourselves as parents is a crucial part of this journey. And again, I know people coming in here today to talk about education probably didn't think they had to think about these sort of things, but they're important. Why did I decide to have a child? Did I decide? And of course the answer is, no matter what our circumstances, yes we did. Absolutely we did. And so we have to go back to that core thing of, why do we choose? What influenced our decision? And that of course helps us to value our child even more. And then the last piece of this is the ability to develop and grow. You're learning all the time, we know this as parents, from the moment they're born right to, to when they're adults, we're continually learning, we're developing, if we allow ourselves to do that. So that's, the, that's number one. And the reason I'm focusing on five is because I understand that a number always gets through to people. Okay? So if you don't remember anything else about this talk, you'll remember the number five. Okay? Um, what's, the second? what's the second thing? The second key thing is that we teach our child how to be happy. Okay? And there's lots of different psychological terms used to describe this. But essentially it's about not saying our child should be happy all the time. But it's about this concept that our child should know how to be happy. So there's lots of different ways we know how to do that, right? Teaching how to reframe, celebrating their strengths, nurturing their values, teaching them to understand and deal with their feelings and emotions, teaching them self-reflection, uh, talking, modeling the skills of positive action and thinking, teaching problem-solving skills and rewarding them for thinking and acting, acting positively. You'll notice that there's nothing in there that talks about negative. So, if there's only two things we do for our kids, one of them should be about teaching them how to be happy. And we all know that day to day we have things that are sad and upsetting, and so our children have those experiences as well. We also know there's lots of times when they have happy 
joyful experiences, but most of the experiences are just in the middle somewhere. And so we can teach our kids to have that positive outlook on life, to be able to be happy. We have, we have really given them a tremendous amount. What's number three? Number three is helping them to feel good about themselves, so have self-belief. Again, an essential component of emotional development and an essential component of being uh, constructive, of being able to engage with the education system appropriately, uh, of being able to learn. What are the key skills around that? Teaching and modelling listening and communication skills. And I'm going to talk about that in a bit more detail in a couple of minutes. Helping them to have spiritual or philosophical beliefs. And again, this is not a popular thing in, in, uh, at the moment to talk about spiritual and philosophical beliefs, but essentially everybody needs to believe in something beyond themselves. Otherwise, it's very hard to deal with adversity, uh, very hard to deal with difficulties. Um, supporting them to treat themselves well. Teaching and modelling self-discipline and building positive self-esteem. All essential to the concept of self-belief. Again, if there's three things that we can do for our kids, this is an essential third one. Giving them self-belief. Let's talk about communication for a minute. Uh, communication is probably one of the most important ways that we can develop these particular skills. Self-belief and also this ability to be happy. And again, this involves a whole range of different skills for parents. Probably the most important one is this idea of trying to know and understand our kids and their abilities at any given time. Now, this is a spreadsheet that I've thrown up here and I'm not expecting people to see much of it. But the key thing is, I always give the example of trying to... A French person walks in the room and we realise that they don't speak English. We know that our obligation is to communicate with them. We don't keep bombarding them with English, complicated English, and hoping that they'll figure it out. With kids, sometimes we do that. And so sometimes the challenge for us is to find ways to communicate that they will understand at a particular time in their lives. That, that can be around understanding that younger kids need concrete ways to communicate, and as they get older, they become uh, able to deal with the more abstract concepts. That involves us working on that stuff. And that's just one example, communication. Listening is also uh, involves all those skills. So understanding what our child's abilities are at any given time, not expecting too much from them in terms of what they can and can't say. So asking them open-ended questions when they're five or six is probably a waste of time because we know that they're, 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 they're only able to deal with the concrete. They're only learning to get into the abstract. As teenagers, open-ended questions work very well because the more concrete they are, the less you're likely to move on from yes, no, yes, no. I can see some people have teenagers in the room, yeah. I don't want to, anybody who hasn't got a teenager, don't want to depress you, okay? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm really smug about this because my two are now grown up, so I'm all right. <laughs> um, the fourth thing, creating a mentally healthy environment for our children. And this is, this is, you know, a lot of focus on this over the last 10 years in Ireland, and, and probably rightly so. But this is really about the basics, making sure that they feel safe at home and school and all they do, protecting their physical and emotional safety, nurturing their physical health, diet, exercise, sleep, all of those things, supporting them to value and respect themselves, and arming them with the skills to identify and cope with danger and risk, while all the time keeping risks in perspective. And one of the things I think as parents certainly I get a feeling of, and I, and I suppose a lot of people like myself have to take the, the blame for this, people tend to uh, worry a lot about their kids and they tend not to take as many risks as maybe they should. And that's because you have people like me on the radio, as the chair said, saying, you know, be careful, your children might be abused and all that sort of stuff. And in a way, you know, we have overemphasized that. Of course, there are always dangers. But part of parenting is about putting those dangers in perspective and about remembering that there's a lot of good people who are interacting with our kids every day of the week, teachers, bus drivers, all those people who have kids themselves and who want to do well for those kids and our kids. But on the other hand, we do need to take uh, precautions and we do need to act if things arise where we believe our children are in danger, where issues arise. Are there specific dangers we need to be aware of? Yeah, I think there's a couple. There's new ones. Some are old, but new, take new forms. And we know all about them. And I know that the National Parents Council do lots of training in all these areas, bullying, particularly cyberbullying now, although 
with, with, with primary school kids, that's a, that's a little less likely. But nonetheless, we're talking to parents who've got kids in sixth class and fifth class who are experiencing this stuff. Alcohol and drug usage. Um, no point in talking about these things in first year. Uh, at that stage, they've already developed some level of knowledge about what's going on, either from older kids or from just being in playing in the community in school. So in, not, in national school is the time to talk about these dangers. And of course, the whole internet. And I don't want to overemphasize this today because it's not any greater than any other risk, but the internet does carry specific risks which we need to be educating and training our kids on when they're in third, fourth, fifth class, not when they're in third year. Uh, transition year and they don't want to talk to you about them. Okay, I want to just break there for a moment. Um, I want you to get those four pieces of paper. Can we see all the paper? Yeah, everyone has four pieces of paper. Excellent. That's good. What I want you to do is just take five minutes, maybe three minutes. I see on you giving me the, the bad eye there, which means three minutes. Uh, I want you to discuss one memory with the person beside you, okay? I want you to put one memory in your pocket for safekeeping. In other words, the memory that you feel is the most important for you to carry with you. All right? And then I want you to take the two memories you want to get rid of, and I want you to stick them in the buckets that are going to be going around the room in a couple of minutes. Okay? So, first and foremost, let's take the memory you'd like to discuss with the person beside you. Okay? It can be a negative or a positive one. So, turn to the person beside you and, and, and chat to them about that. All right? To, into your pocket or your bag or your purse or wherever and can I ask you to get rid of the other two into the into the uh, buckets that are the um, yeah excellent the box has gone around the room there yeah great stuff okay. has, while, while, we're, while we're doing that can I can I ask would anybody well, any, I, I, it's fascinating to watch the body language. People are smiling up here. There's people up here and they're doing this sort of... And, 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 and <laughs> I'm not sure if that's a positive or negative memory. But, um, could I... Anybody know what the purpose of that exercise is? Anybody brave enough to speak in a room full of 250 people? <laughs> At the back there, yes. Okay, anyone else? Any views on it? Yourself here, yeah. Uh, maybe because we are going along in our Okay, good. So, so, so the lady at the back here is saying that the idea is that you hold on to something positive and you try and get rid of the negatives, and you're saying that it's, the exercise is useful in terms of understanding other people who want to experience the same thing as you. Yeah, anybody else? Yes, yourself here. Okay. Um, about a exercise, you know, the one you keep back, the memory that you want to keep back in your pocket. Um, most likely will be the good one, you know, for you to, to enable your child to have that experience as well. Okay, great. Last one, yeah? 
Yes, you're definitely right. And I kept the negative one because it's something that you do. And it's something I want to work on. So that's the one I keep in my pocket. So even when you're a child and to work to help the child to work on something we all need to know that we need to keep working on something okay great um there's lots of different i'm sure i could go around the room and get lots of different views and everybody's right but the main purpose of this exercise is really quite simple we we don't leave our own school experiences behind us and no matter how hard we try to say this is my child going into this new school and it's nothing to do with my experiences of course, our school experiences sit at the back of our mind. And if they were negative, and the teacher looks at our child in a particular way or says something, sometimes it's very hard to leave our experiences behind. And of course, those experiences will influence how we view the school, how we view our child's development. If our child doesn't make friends quickly, we go back immediately to, you know, I remember when I was in first class and nobody talked to me or I wasn't invited to that party, etc., etc. So part of, part of our challenge as parents is always to try and resolve our own childhoods in regards to particularly school because it has such an influence. And so the purpose of this exercise is simply to remind us of that. can't be done today, but there is no doubt that as you, when you go in to school in September when you're or next week, remember when you're walking in the school gate or when you're sitting at the parents' council meeting that a lot of what's going on in your head is to do with your own school experiences. Okay, we're going to move on. Um, what's our role with siblings? So we've talked a little bit about what our role is with our own child. What's our role with siblings? I think there's four things that really we have to do as parents. One is to teach mutual respect. It doesn't mean everyone has to love each other all the time. It's just about respecting each other. And that means families, all families respect each other, whatever the circumstances. Whether we have separation, whether we have uh, grannies living in the house, whatever. Because the, the modern day family is quite unusual, lots of different structures. Mutual respect. Encourage and model positive family communication. So again we're back to this positive thing, not negatives. Of course there's negatives, rows, fights and all the rest, but encourage the positive pieces. Wasn't it nice we were able to discuss the holidays? Wasn't it nice we were able to discuss what happened in the friends last night? Whatever it might be, okay? Nurture problem solving skills. In a house with five, four, three people, you gotta have problem solving skills. You gotta solve problems. What do you watch on TV? What do you do on a Sunday, etc.? And reinforce family awareness, introspection, and emotional intelligence. How many times do we talk about how the family's functioning? How many times? I'm not talking about you know sitting around the table and being heavy. I'm talking about just the basic things that you say. You know, do we ever talk to our partner? Do we talk to the kids about how they find the family as an environment? And that's always useful to do. What's our role with friends? This is a tricky one. Um, the first thing we've got to do is guide and support our child through the friendship process. Um, accepting those that they choose as their friends, we have to do that. Teaching them how friends treat each other and helping them resolve difficulties. Supporting them when relationships break down and probably the most important one is only intervene directly if absolutely necessary. Even the youngest kids will be able to choose their own friends. And the friendship process is, of course, different as kids grow up and things that happen at 4 or 5 are less dramatic than they happen at 15 or 16. But nonetheless, we should be very reluctant to intervene. And of course, I know that very often in an early stage, parents determine who their kids play with. But as you'll see, they very quickly start to find their own friends, enjoy themselves more with some kids than others, etc., etc. So... Finally, get to the topic, as they say. What is the role with the school? In my view, and I know that the National Parents Council have a policy that parents should be involved in education as much as possible, and I support that. I think that's absolutely correct. I think the question is how, and, and how do you get the balance right? So I've, I've narrowed it down to really three things when it comes to the school. The first one is choose the school, school wisely. Now, I know that many people, they don't have a choice. In national school, you have what you have. But nonetheless, Choose a school wisely is an important principle to have because what that does, it, it, it's a mistake to say, well, look, I'm, I, you know, it's a local school, so I'm just going to send it to local school. Think about the school. What is its strengths? What is its weaknesses? Etc. Etc. Be vigilant. So watchful of what's happening. Not overly cautious, not overly involved. Just keep an eye and build appropriate constructive relationships with school staff. Um, 
That is my view on what essentially parents should be involved in in the education system. I think that if parents follow the five rules and work on the five key things that might make their kids emotionally healthy, I think that the education and academic piece will come uh, by itself. I think where the difficulties arise is where the school, where difficulties arise in the school, where we don't intervene, where we're not involved at appropriate levels with the school, or where we become too involved. So we're, we're, we're not just doing the maths homework, we're actually uh, trying to be the teacher at home. We're not just uh, giving them the space to do their English essay, we're actually trying to teach them English at home, etc. Or we're down in the school every day. Um, what's our child and teacher's role? Well, I think it's very simple in the education system. Our child is to learn academically to the best of their capabilities, to learn to socialise, to open up their thinking to new things, and to enjoy themselves. It's really important that we don't forget that last one. What's the teacher's role? The teacher's role is to teach and to create a safe, nurturing environment. Now, if I spoke to a teacher today, they'd probably say, well, we have millions of things to do. But essentially, that's their role. So, what's the balance? What am I talking about when I talk about balance? I think there's probably three key things that we need to watch out for when we're dealing with schools, when we're, when we're dealing with our child's education. The first one is our expectations. And this is where you come back to this whole point about letting our child be themselves, having an understanding of our child's developmental, likely developmental pathway, um, giving our child the ability to um, feel good about themselves, to achieve, to be achievers in their own eyes. If our expectations are too high, then they will never achieve that. If our expectations of our child are too high, our expectations of the school will be too high, and they will never achieve that. And if our expectations of our child and the school are too high, then our expectations of ourselves will be too high, and we'll feel disappointed as parents. On the other hand, we have to have expectations. And one of the key things for us is to make sure that they're reasonable, but reasonable on the side of, of wanting, to, wanting to achieve things for our child and expecting the school to do well, expecting that the school will do well and yes, being disappointed if they don't, as opposed to expecting difficulties. The second key balance is this over-involved and under-involved, and I think this is particularly relevant for the people in this room, because most of the people in this room, as I understand it, are on National Parents Councils. So the inclination is to be maybe over-involved in the schools. Um, now, I, I know that some parents' councils, it's basically the view of the school might be, you run the cake sale and you do all that stuff, and you don't get involved with the actual policy or any of that thing. Um, it's, it's, it's really important that parents are involved in policy. It's really important that parents are involved in the key uh, decisions around the school. But that's in, 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 at a corporate level as a group. But as an individual, it's really important that we step back, that we allow our child to broker their own involvement, but that we get involved only when necessary. We go to the teachers' meetings as requested, we engage fully, we're aware of what's happening, but we're not down there every day, we're not sitting in the principal's office, we're not confusing our role as on the parents' council with our role as parents. And then the last one is this thing of communication, too much or too little. Again, tricky, but again, for parents who are already involved in the school, something that we just need to be careful about. Every school should welcome communication, but of course we all know that if it's continuous or over the top, it creates difficulties. We also know that if we're not communicating, then our child will get lost. Um, I'm going to finish up, uh, and it's a, it's a, it's a, I suppose it's a principle, a very simple principle. I hope I've convinced you of it, and that is that children spend approximately one third of their childhoods in school. This inevitably has a major impact on their emotional well-being and their development. It impacts on how they view themselves socially and intellectually and whether they believe they're clever, good at achieving things, and popular. It teaches them how to get on with others, how to work, and how to compete. School plays a key role in promoting and enhancing our child's emotional health. Academic achievement, in my view, is secondary to this, because without emotional health, academic achievement becomes irrelevant. I didn't give you any references today, but if you look back, right back to the Greek philosophers, they will say, if you create the right environment, if you make people 
and help people feel good about themselves and give them confidence. They will find the way to learn. They will seek out the books. They will, they will go to the areas because it's a natural thing we all want to do is get information, build our knowledge. It's the blocks to that that we have to be careful of. If there's a last thing I would say today, um, it would be trust more and worry less. Um, when I come and I talk to, to people, uh, like the people who are in this room, I know I'm talking to committed policy makers, uh, committed researchers and committed parents. At some level I'm a fraud because I'm telling you stuff you already know. So the only message I really have today is try and forget about your own childhoods and have absolute trust in your own ability and have absolute trust in your, in your children. Thank you very much.